So it sounds almost too obvious to mention, but core to really succeeding as a chief of staff requires knowing explicitly what the role actually entails. So a surprising number of folks that we interviewed for this actually get to their three, six, 12 month milestones without actually knowing what the job entails. And so to put a finer point on that, one person we spoke to actually said, I left the job after 18 months without really knowing what job I was leaving. So a successful chief of staff will have answers to the following. They'll know their responsibilities, they'll know their accountabilities, and they'll know how they will be supported to deliver on them. From McKinsey & Company, I'm Sean Brown, and welcome to Inside the Strategy Room. That was Connor Rochford, a consultant in our London office and the co-leader of our chief of staff service line. He was distilling the central theme of our latest research into how to master the chief of staff role. It is a uniquely challenging role that's hard to prepare for, while it's also one that can open many opportunities in an executive's future career. Connor, it's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's great to be here. Also joining us today is Blair Epstein, a partner in our Bay Area office and a leader in our CEO excellence practice. Blair helps CEOs and senior executives transform their organization's performance from strategy to execution. She was also instrumental in the creation of our New York Times bestseller, CEO Excellence. Blair, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sean. And I'd also like to welcome Poppy Johnson, a consultant in our London office who co-leads our chief of staff service line in the UK. Poppy, it's great to have you here with us today. Thanks for having me. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. I should also note for our audience that uh, each of our guests has previously served as a chief of staff. And today's discussion builds on a McKinsey.com article that Poppy and Connor co-authored along with Andrew Goodman titled, Seeing Around Corners, how to excel as a chief of staff. We've included a link to the article for you in the show notes. Okay, Blair, perhaps you can start us off. What's unique about the chief of staff role and what kind of research did the team undertake to arrive at their key advice? Good morning here from California. Um, I'm particularly excited to be spending today talking about the chief of staff role. It is a uniquely compelling role. It is an impactful role. And it can also be, be a challenging role. It can be a role where people feel alone, feel isolated, feel like they're trying to to bear the weight of the world on their shoulders. And my hope is for those of you who are chiefs of staff listening today, that we can can give you some suggestions that you may want to put into place to make the job that much better. In terms of how we came to this research, I've worked with a number of chiefs of staff. Uh, I've played the role myself. And what's fascinating is if you ask three different people, what is it that a chief of staff does, you will get three different answers. And so we decided to embark on a bit more of a structured research effort to better understand the role and better support those who are in it. One key element of that has been more than a decade's worth of convening chiefs of staff, particularly in the UK. We've had more than 200 folks in that role come together to learn from each other and to share what they're doing in the role, what's working, what's not. We've then augmented that with additional research, in-depth conversations with more than 10 folks currently in the role, a literature review to make sure we truly understand what is it that chiefs of staff do so well and how can they do it even better still. We also have tapped into the body of research we've done um, on CEOs. As Sean mentioned, we've got a best-selling book called CEO Excellence. And when we talked to those CEOs about what was it that allowed the highest performing CEOs of the last 20 years to truly outperform, most of them talked about this role. They talked about the chief of staff role. And they talked about how this role was so important to their success. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite examples of that was when we were interviewing Brad Smith about his time at Intuit. He described originally coming into the CEO role as a skeptic. He didn't want a chief of staff. And along the way, he changed his mind. And once he did, he described it as being a complete game changer in his tenure. That he found a way that he could have more impact than he thought possible, that he could have a, a partner in crime by his side, someone who could help make change happen. Thanks, Blair. Um, Connor, let's talk a little bit about the research. You've synthesized interviews with more than 200 chiefs of staff into eight pieces of practical advice. What's the first key to mastering the chief of staff role? So it sounds almost too obvious to mention, but core to really succeeding as a chief of staff requires knowing explicitly what the role actually entails. So a surprising number of folks that we interviewed for this actually get to their three, six, 12 month milestones without actually knowing 
what the job entails. And so to put a finer point on that, one person we spoke to actually said, I left the job after 18 months without really knowing what job I was leaving. So a successful chief of staff will have answers to the following. They'll know their responsibilities, they'll know their accountabilities, and they'll know how they will be supported to deliver on them. So like Blair was saying, it's a hugely varied role. Uh, And a former senior colleague of mine used to talk about it as you're successfully doing your job if you're helping me to be successful as my, at, at mine. And so I think that's that's useful. It's a useful sentiment and, and conviction. But translating that into sort of day-to-day is going to depend on a variety of factors. So how big is the organization? What's the shape? What's the sector? What are the specific dynamics? Who is your principal? And in short, the role can cover everything from administrative, operational, strategic, being the eyes and the ears of the CEO or your principal, including sort of down to owning the delivery of of priority projects. So recognizing how broad it is and and how important it is to get really clear on that job description, I think it's worth finally noting that getting clear on it isn't, isn't easy, right? So your principal, either rightly or wrongly, might want to maintain a level of, of ambiguity as to what your role actually entails and hope that you can play a bit of a jack of all trades type of role. And so it's really a challenge in, in being direct and, and shaping that job description. And, and someone we interviewed spoke about, you have to be direct with the principal, you need to pin them down and you need to know the space that you're actually going into. So once you've done all of that, having clarity on the job description is only helpful if that's then communicated out down and across the organization so a ceo or principal's chief of staff ultimately serves the entire organization the broader management team and so making that that really clear and the the role parameters uh is is mission critical indeed i'd imagine it would be connor thank you i mean it's also clear that the nature of this role will actually need to suit the organization the chief of staff is operating in Blair, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into the CEO excellence research that you mentioned, and perhaps you could share some examples from that of how high-performing CEOs shape the role of their chief of staff. Yeah, maybe, thanks, Connor. Maybe I'll bring this to life from the principal's point of view, um, right? So I spend a lot of my time um, helping CEOs think through how to succeed in their role. And as part of their research, we also spoke with Ajay Banga about his time at MasterCard. And he described his chief of staff job description as making sure I don't screw up, which on the one hand is beautifully simple, right? And absolutely clear. On the other hand, what on earth does that mean you're doing every day? And so one example of that, one thing that Ajay asked of his chiefs of staff that many folks do um, is to help them make sure they're putting their time and energy where it matters most. So when Ajay described his time at MasterCard, he actually described stumbling really badly in his first year in terms of his time and energy and his personal operating model, right? Because he described that he was trying to do everything and that simply doesn't work. And so over time, one thing he leaned on his chief of staff to do was to help him build discipline around his calendar, around how he used his time, around where he put his energy so that it lined up with his priorities. So he was spending time with the right groups of folks at the right times on the right topics. And this, this is one of the very common Not all chiefs of staff do this. Many don't. Many do different things. But this is one example of a way that a principal might ask their chief of staff to amplify their influence. Other folks we talk to, other CEOs and senior executives, describe using their chief of staff as their truth teller in chief. When you're a senior executive, you can live in almost a reality distortion field because people may start telling you what you want to hear instead of what's happening on the ground. And they lean on their chiefs of staff to kind of be the person who's their trusted confidant, their advisor, who will tell them, like, no, actually, here's what you need to do or here's what's really going on. So, again, a huge range of what the role can entail. So with such diverse responsibilities, are there any typical career patterns or archetypes that would lead someone to serve as a chief of staff or perhaps help define what is included in their role? Or are the paths to the role as varied as the role itself? So I'd say we see two different patterns of chiefs of staff at the highest level. In most cases, and this is the most known pattern, it's certainly not though the only pattern, the chief of staff role is is a temporary role in the sense that folks spend a couple of years in the role um, for two reasons. The first is to do the job, right? To help their principal, to amplify 
their impact, whatever that means, based on their job description. The second, though, is it's a deliberate investment in the organization and talent development. This flavor of chief of staff is often um, a high potential mid-career talent who's being moved into the role to complement whatever experience they already have with experience kind of at the highest levels of enterprise leadership. And so there's, there's a twofold investment there. And so in this case, it's less about what you already know, it's about your potential. There is a second flavor of chief of staff, more the career chief of staff model, where this is someone who's making this their job over the longer term. And again, they may come from any number of backgrounds going into the role, but once they get there, they truly excel at helping to support their principal, connect the dots, amplify impact across the organization. And they may over time add additional work to their portfolio. For example, uh, many chiefs of staff in smaller organizations double as a formal or informal chief strategy officer. That comes with its own qualifications. Other chiefs of staff we know might pick up functions like marketing, communications, and people functions, parts of, say, the DEI agenda. And so you end up having this portfolio of work based on your unique passions and qualifications. Uh, so all of that to say it's a bit of a dreaded consultant answer. It depends. But we see a huge range of profiles and qualifications. I, I could see how it would depend. And I imagine in some companies, especially firms that are growing rapidly, the requirements for that chief of staff role could change dramatically over time as well. Connor, perhaps you could comment on how the role might evolve in a scenario like that and whether the competencies need to evolve at the same time. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Sean. And I think the, the answer to that is the capabilities of the individuals in the organization are going to change and grow as the organization needs change and grow. So that's true both for the individual and the chief of staff role, but also the sort of the office of the CEO is going to change and grow. And so being open to sort of reevaluating that and, and like I was sort of saying, like being super clear on what the responsibilities are, being really clear on what your accountabilities are, and then making sure that you have the support needed to be able to, to deliver on that is, is critical. So we've heard the term principal come out a number of times so far in our conversation, um, not CEO. Maybe you could just describe why you're using that word instead of CEO. And Poppy, perhaps you could just take us through a little bit of how the chief of staff role may apply more broadly beyond just working with a chief executive officer. Yeah, certainly. It's a great question. We say principal because in its origins, the chief of staff role actually doesn't come from the private sector. It's a term that comes from the military, from government, and Blair alluded to it earlier, but not every principal is a CEO. Most of them are, a lot of them are. But actually now we're seeing as the role proliferates, as it moves beyond government and public sector and military into the corporate world, it's now going beyond big corporates. And we see tech firms, we see startups where from the uh, beginning, the CTO or the CSO, they may have their own chief of staff. So we say principal to make it clear that you can chief of staff anyone. Things will be different. It will vary even more. But given the role's history, the most famous one perhaps is the White House chief of staff. But just to make it clear that it's not a role that can only exist in the context of a big corporate with a CEO. Thank you so much, Poppy. So let's now move on to the second insight from your research on the importance of earning one's principal's trust. Connor, how should chiefs of staff go about building and maintaining that trusting relationship? So look, in terms of building trust, so as uh, Blair, again, highlighted at the start, it is a incredibly privileged role, both personally and professionally. And so earning, growing, and maintaining trust is a priority beyond anything else. That's true at the start of the role, it's true during the role, and it's true as you get to the end of the role. Um, so a chief of staff who was uh, the sort of chief of staff of the head of the civil service said that on day one, his principal pulled him in and said, you're going to read all of my emails, join all of my meetings, and listen to all of my calls, except for those with my wife. So that, that's a, a pretty extreme demonstration of trust. Now, as an aside to that, that's an awful lot of responsibility and it quickly became apparent for the chief of staff that balancing all of those conversations to be in meant that it was impossible to actually do his job. So finding that balancing act is, is important. Trust applies not only to the principal or boss, but actually 
to their entire broader leadership team. So as we heard uh, in our research, it's, it's difficult to balance both being a, a trusted, confident to the principal, but also a sounding board to their broader team, and then pick and choose the moments to deliver sort of home truths delicately to the principal. So earning and maintaining and cultivating trust and then choosing how and when to use it are really important. And then finally on this one, it's important to be able to identify and act on when the trust isn't there. So that can happen for for a variety of different reasons. When it does, it's important to not put your head in the sand and pretend that it that it's not going on. There are a different variety of tactics and activities that you can put in place to try and address it. And it's going to depend on on the circumstance. But just recognizing that it, that it can happen if it does happen, that you're not not alone. It, it happens to lots of folks in this role. So reading all the principal's emails, going to all their meetings, listening in on all their calls and being in the know on everything they're involved in and and thinking, that sounds like it could potentially lead to some ambiguity around when the chief of staff is acting in their own capacity and when they're acting as their principal's proxy. Blair, do you have any advice on how to effectively manage and, and clarify that aspect of the role? have to be extraordinarily clear um, when it is you, when you're acting as a proxy, and also acknowledge when you don't have the information you need. If you want your chief of staff to be able to act as your proxy, to be able to run a special project as though they were you, to be able even to make sure that you are living your priorities fully, you have to give them an extraordinary amount of context and access. And so if you're in that position of principle, Think through what it would take to make that happen. If part of what you want from them is to be your truth teller, think through what you have to do to help them not only build trust with you, but to help them build trust with your team and throughout the organization so that they can play that role for you. Um, If you don't do that for them, your chief of staff won't be able to do for you what you need of them. That makes a lot of sense, Blair. Thank you. And, And Poppy, can you now take us through the third key insight? Thanks, John. And yeah, interesting that uh, we're talking about things potentially going wrong in the beginning uh, and being super transparent about what your role is, what your role isn't. It leads nicely onto nailing your firsts. And of course, anyone in a new role, whatever it is, you always want to make a good first impression. As a chief of staff, it's even more complicated. It's even harder because you're thinking about your own firsts. And in a lot of cases, if your principal, your CEO is new to the role as well. Maybe they've been recently promoted or they're new to the the organization. You have to think about theirs too. And in a lot of cases, there will be that first board meeting. There will be that first capital markets day. And as well as thinking about how you debut onto the scene yourself, you're thinking about how you can best support your CEO, which is why knowing what's their working style is, what their priorities are, uh, and knowing the principles that will help you make split-second decisions when you are in those tricky first times of uh, leadership team meetings, etc. And indeed, the the things that you can't plan for, I think, as well as knowing those priorities of the, the CEO, it's really important as well to make time to look around corners perhaps more so than in any other role, you're, you're anticipating what might come around the corner as a challenge for you, but also for someone else. And it's your job to, to do that for them. So that's certainly not a, a formula for guaranteed success every single time, but the more preparation you can do, the better. And if you take that sense of preparation through the entire tenure of your role, that will set you in good stead. And if I take this again from the principal's point of view and broaden it, um, we we advise new CEOs, new executives all the time. They have to nail their first. The trick, though, is they also have to nail their seconds and their thirds and their fourths. And so as a chief of staff, nailing their your first, helping them nail their first is just the start of this. So, for example, a number of our CEOs describe how they use um, use their chiefs of staff to help them nail board interactions or investor calls, right, which are classic high stakes moments of truth in those roles. And so... For example, Gail Kelly at Westpac in Australia uses her chief of staff when she was in a role there, asked her team to tell her chief of staff what sort of formal and informal interactions they were having with the board so that then her chief of staff could infuse that into how they 
how they prepared Gail for her board interaction. Michael Fisher at Cincinnati Children's Hospital had a longtime career chief of staff and described how in their interpersonal interactions, he could meet with her and in a one-hour visit, get through eight topics in a way that meant he didn't have to schedule eight other meetings, which is brilliant, but more importantly, that she was helping him nail other moments of truth, right? She's integrating across the major transformation. She was acting as a liaison to the board, preparing for the top team meetings, leading a department. And so again, nail the first, but start figuring out what are the seconds, thirds, and fourths that you can also help your principal get ahead of. Sure. So do you have any advice for principals who are considering whom they should select to be their chief of staff? Should one's chief of staff have a similar set of skills as the principal, or should they complement the principal's strengths? When we're counseling CEOs on this, we actually counsel them to start with kind of their side of the bargain when it comes to getting clear on the job description. Because there are so many different flavors of chiefs of staff, from folks who are kind of operational powerhouses helping them get things done, to folks who are playing a key strategist role, to folks who are kind of truly personally invested in the personal operating model of their principal, you have to start by thinking through, given who you are as an executive, and importantly, given what your context and your company, your organization needs from you, what do you need from your chief of staff? And so we actually advise them, write down, what are the three to five biggest missions that you want the chief of staff role to deliver for you? That then gives you a pretty clear roadmap to start thinking through, what is it that you want from your chief of staff? Um, and so in a lot of cases that will, Sean, end up doing what you suggested, right? Complementing your natural strengths. But it's not because it complements you per se. It's because it helps the chief of staff do the job you want them to do. Thank you so much. So the fourth insight from the article is to ensure that the CEO's office is not an island. Blair, maybe you could take us through that. Yeah. There's a little bit of a paradox here as a, as a chief of staff. Part of your job is to help your CEO, your principal, focus on their priorities. And there can be a bit of a gatekeeping component to that or a version of, hey, I'm going to go do this instead of you, CEO, because you don't have time and it's not at the top of your list, but it needs to happen anyhow. That motion, that motion of protecting your CEO so they can focus on their priorities creates distance between you and them and the rest of the organization, between the outside stakeholders you're interacting with. If you do that motion too often, however, it can backfire because you can actually end up isolating both yourself and your principal in a way that's very counterproductive. Because no CEO, no executive, no leader can lead effectively from the ivory tower, right? They both lose touch with what's going on and people lose their sense of trust and connection with that principal, with that executive. And so you have to find a way to do the both and. You have to find a way to help your principal focuses on, focus on what matters and increase, not decrease, their connection to the topics and the people that matter most. And that can happen in a lot of different ways, right? Some chiefs of staff find themselves counseling their CEO and maybe taking on a formal leadership role when it comes to corporate communications or external communications, right? Making sure that they're getting the right messages to the right people at the right time. You might also be helping them Hold the space for informal connections, right? Walking the hallways, making site visits, having breakfast chats, one-on-one, skip levels, right? Whatever it works that works for your CEO, you might be making sure they both do that and direct it where it will be most impactful. Other times you might be playing that truth teller role that we've mentioned. Greg Case at Aon, for example, described of his chiefs of staff that one of the things they do is serve as what he called a safety valve, right? A safety valve so that when people were worried or a little bit disgruntled, but maybe weren't yet ready to raise it directly to him, they could go through his chief of staff. And so those concerns could be heard. She could filter through them, figure out where are their patterns, and then make sure they were getting escalated where that made sense. Now that, of course, requires a lot of discretion and judgment because you run the risk of being put into the center of some of the office politics in a way that can be very counterproductive. Thanks, Blair. And that's a great point about making sure to stay out of the office politics. And in fact, that brings us to the fifth insight from the article, which is that chiefs of staff should exert influence, but without playing politics. Poppy, how do you do that? It almost sounds like an impossible task. Completely agree. I think uh, it's no mean feat to, to pull this off, especially if you're new in the role and especially if you're new to the organization. And as we said at the beginning, we do find usually that 
at least a lot of the chiefs of staff we speak to know the organization really well. They have that institutional knowledge that helps them be really successful. Equally, starting out in a new organization as a chief of staff can uh, can be really impactful too, although it makes this part around the politics a little more challenging. We've touched on you know, not speaking on behalf of the CEO, but using their halo influence. So I won't spend too much time on, on that part of the uh, theme. But we did hear some interesting anecdotes during our interviews that because of the loneliness of the role, because often you're the only one in the entire organization, you don't have a peer group as such. We found that what helps some chiefs of staff is to use a executive coach uh, and that often the principal is only too supportive of that. And it it can be someone who is on a retainer with your company or somebody that you find yourself, but someone with the professional um, confidentiality that that you would need just to be able to talk things through, get a different perspective, given that so often you're dealing with really, really sensitive uh, topics for very high profile people. So that's one way we found that you can have the opportunity to vent occasionally, which uh, is something that I think we all need from time to time. But you're you're not miring yourself in internal politics by doing so. Well, oh, that's a great point. Uh, thank you, Poppy. And Connor, can you take us through the sixth key? How should chiefs of staff hone their peripheral vision? Yeah, thanks, Sean. So uh, as, uh, I mean, Blair, you, you teed this up really well before with the example from, from Greg Case. So the chief of staff ser- serves as the the principal's eyes and ears, helping them to sort of anticipate and head off challenges and surprises, and to prioritise workflow. But that can't just be good news stories. And we heard this a lot from from folks that we we spoke to. Is that often there's the temptation to to bring good news, like look at this PL or look at this project we're delivering, or isn't this wonderful? But what's really important is a well-connected chief of staff knows and informs their principal about what's happening on the front lines, both both good and bad. And so at the same time, linking back to the, the point I was making earlier, it's really critical that you're able to be clear on what's important and what's not important for your principal to know. So as one current chief of staff put it, you need to have a compass of what you perceive to be the right thing to bring to your boss's or principal's attention. In terms of practical things to really help hone that uh, peripheral vision, one way to sort of reduce surprises is to really align with your principal on their professional and personal calendar. So that might be the business cycle, it might be executive committees, it might be board meetings, quarterly reviews, uh, but it's also sort of business trips and holidays. And so one chief of staff that we interviewed would set aside the 48 hours immediately following his principal jetting off for their annual international holiday because he knew that he would need that 48 hours to immediately action the 50-page email that the, the principal would write on, on the plane. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess the first time that they uh, figured that one out was probably a painful 48 hours. But to follow up on the point that you just made, how should chiefs of staff organize their work with their principal and make sure that they're continually aligned? Is it typically a daily download, a stand-up? Is it sharing calendars electronically, end-of-day emails, or is it all of the above? I'll, uh, I'll be brief, but it's funny. We were just talking about this. We had a, a chief of staff event in London last week, and we did some breakout sessions. One of the topics was about how to make this role sustainable. And one of those questions and things we debated was exactly that. So how do you manage the constant information flow without becoming overwhelmed? Uh, and just tactically, how do you deal with it? And the common theme was that you need to proactively figure out and ask your principal how they like to work. It requires a lot of self-awareness on behalf of the on the part of the principal. But find out, you know, are they expecting you to be replying to emails at the weekend? Are they expecting an acknowledgement of the email? Are they expecting that it will just get done and you'll only reach out if you have challenges? And these are things I guess that that sometimes we when we're starting out in our career, we we kind of have on our mind to, you know, report back to our boss all the time. And they're the things that then as you become more senior, you start to have folks doing that with you. I think one nuance of the chief of staff role is that 
you are then really tightly aligned with one person and you're there in service to them and the company. So I think just transparent conversation about what they expect. And ideally in the interview process, you would have figured out maybe if your principal is really extroverted and they talk to think and you're very introverted and you need kind of time to to decompress, then that's not to say it can't work, but you just need to, to think of the practicalities of how it would work. Yes, I suppose you could also include that in the job description, right? And, uh, and that leads really neatly into the seventh key for chiefs of staff, which is to make the role your own. Poppy, do you want to take us through the practicalities of making the role your own? Yes, absolutely. And actually, as it happens, we've, we've covered some of these points already through the questions. I think it's a mistake when it feels like you're kind of starting a new role and then you surface two years later and you, you don't really know where you are in terms of your own trajectory. We're kind of starting to think about what happens next. As you mentioned, Sean, right at the beginning, sometimes a chief of staff is just a chief of staff. Sometimes they are also a chief strategy officer, especially if, if we're talking about a small startup or a scale up. I think what's important is that that you communicate and have an open line of communication to your principal around the topics that that you love, that you're good at, and and where you want to go. And it can be hard to kind of come up for air and think about actually what am I getting out of this. But you will have been hired and, and you know, principals are hiring chiefs of staff because of the skills they bring and their kind of intersection of industry experience and talent. So that's not to say that you, you can't start to think about what else you might be able to take on alongside the, the high priority items. And I think more so than in any other role, aside from officially, you know, taking on a, a new C-suite title. I think what's uh, what's nice about this role is that it can change. You can do a quick project where you can dive a bit more deeply into technical or specific industry details. Uh, that can be a three-month thing. Uh, it's almost like a little secondment. So I think there's a lot of flexibility in terms of making the role your own. But in addition to making it work for you tactically, like we've just discussed, I think having a view of what else in that organization would you like to do where else can you add value? Obviously, that's that's highly important. Uh, and what what do you do well? And I think having those transparent conversations with your principal will uh, will really help you craft a role that that means something to you and that you can see something developing rather than just two years of insane busyness and you wonder where the time went. So keeping the career trajectory of a chief of staff in mind, let's talk a little bit about the final key, which is managing transitions, both your own and those of your principal. Um, Blair, maybe you could take us through that. Yeah. There's both a transition into the role, which is what we were just talking about. There are also transitions out of the role. And one of the interesting things with this idea of managing your own transitions, in addition to your principal's transition is that when it's about your job and your career, many of the chiefs of staff that I know I speak to very much have a servant leader mentality. It's part of why they're in the role and why they thrive in it. It also makes them very uncomfortable having what they perceive to be self-oriented conversations about their own career. And as a result, they might not be focusing, they might not want to talk about, hey, I think, I think my chapter as chief of staff is coming to an end here soon. What comes next? That feels like a very unnatural conversation to have. If that sounds at all like you or like someone you know, I'd encourage you to flip that on its head. It is essential, not just to you, but to your principal and the organization that you manage your transitions with thoughtfulness and with grace. For example, if you are one of those folks who was pulled into a chief of staff role, mid-career is the way to develop and accelerate your trajectory. It's not selfish to actually spend time with your principal talking about what that looks like. They made the decision to invest in you and they expect a return on their investment, right? They want you to leave the role and to be able to go back into the organization performing at a higher level than you ever did before. And so it's not selfish. It's actually selfless. It is a part of your job to make sure that you can transition out well. And then, of course, to make sure that you can execute a graceful handover with whomever comes in behind you. You may also at some point during your trajectory experience 
a change in your principal, a CEO transition, for example, you have a unique capability if you're an existing chief of staff there to help them equally thoughtfully think about their next chapter. That's something we talk a lot about with CEOs who are leaving and to help whomever it is that's coming into the role to navigate it, right? It is jarring to come into a new executive role. You've got a sense of what's been going well, what's not, where the priorities might be, what's happened historically, where there might be room to improve. And you can, again, play a critical role. Very few people have had the seat that you've had to play that role in managing, yes, your own transition, but also those of others throughout the organization. One thing we had, one memorable quote uh, from our interviews was that it feels like leaving a chief of staff role is a jump into the abyss. And it's similar to the the point earlier around you can leave and not know what role you're leaving. I would just say that uh, it's building on your your point really, Blair, that it's a seat that not many occupy. And one thing I've discussed with chief of staff colleagues is that... It might be difficult to articulate what you've been doing, but if you can find a way to really kind of encapsulate and synthesize what you've been doing in these last 18 months, two years, three years, five years, then it's a role that equips you so well to deal with so many other challenges. There's a relationship piece, there's the knowledge piece, there's the influencing and leadership piece. So I think we we recognize, and and I think those of us who've been chiefs of staff as well recognize the feeling of uh, it's never clear what the next step is, or it's not always clear what the next step is. The good news is that there are tons of next steps, and that it, it's it's a really exciting role in that sense when you're getting to the end of it and thinking about what's next. So one last question as we wrap up: Given the importance of the relationship between the principal and the chief of staff. What would you advise the chief of staff who knows that their principal is going to be moving roles, let's say in a year, 18 months, and how do they think about managing their own transition in that context, either joining the new principal or finding their next role? Yeah, let me take a stab at that from the from the principal's perspective, because the advice that I would offer a chief of staff is actually quite similar to what we'd offer an executive who is looking at wanting to hand over the reins in the next, say, 12 to 18 months. Because as chief of staff, an enormous part of what you can do is to make sure they are being strategic about the key success factors in that transition. So the first thing I would put on their radar is uh, around succession planning. And hopefully this is something that your principal has been doing continuously throughout their tenure as a part of leadership development. Um, If not, you know, better late than never. Um, And even if they have, this is often when, when things will kick into high gear. And you're really thinking about who is it that I've got internally? And if I think about the profile needed for, say, my role, how close are they to being CEO or executive ready? And how can I develop them in thoughtful ways, given whatever time we have left, to increase the odds that we've got someone ready internally? But you might also be thinking through what's the external network we might want to tap into and how can we be ready for that? There's a whole piece around kind of the next generation. There's another piece, though, around thinking through what are the gifts that you could give to that next leader, right? What are the the loose threads that you might tie in a neat bow before someone else has to come in and clean up, right? So if you want to finish writing your current chapter, sometimes that involves making the tough decisions, right? If there are difficult decisions around, say, people or costs or strategy that you've been letting linger, consider if you can bring those to closure before you ask the new executive to do that for you, because that can be very tough in your first chapter. And through all of this, the chief of staff can be an incredible sounding board. And again, a little bit of a dose of reality, especially if, say, politics are kicking up or you're seeing some of those less healthy succession dynamics happening. Again, as a chief of staff, be that early warning sign, look around the corner and help your executive navigate this gracefully. Thank you so much, Blair, Connor, Poppy. This has been a fantastic discussion. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us today. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having us. And thanks for all the questions. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, we'll include a link in the show notes to Poppy and Connor's article, Seeing Around Corners, How to Excel as a Chief of Staff, which you can also find on McKinsey.com. And as always, 
We welcome your feedback and ideas for future podcasts. Our email is itsr at mckinsey.com. Uh, ITSR standing for Inside the Strategy Room. You can also share your ratings and reviews on any podcast player with many thanks to everyone who's already done so. We really appreciate all of your ongoing comments and feedback. Please do keep them coming. And if you enjoyed today's episode and you'd like to subscribe, you can follow our weekly series on any podcast player. And that's where you can also access our entire library of previous episodes. We also offer an Inside the Strategy Room podcast collection page at mckinsey.com slash ITSR. And there you can easily browse our prior podcasts across six major themes, as well as access written transcripts of all of those conversations. Finally, if you'd like to receive automatic updates on our latest publications and insights, we encourage you to sign up for email alerts on our insights page at mckinsey.com slash SCF for strategy and corporate finance, or follow us on Twitter or X at MCK Strategy, or connect with us on LinkedIn at the McKinsey Strategy and Corporate Finance Practice page. Thanks again for listening. We look forward to having you join us again next week inside the Strategy Room.